Well, welcome to the Truth and Precept channel. Today I'm going to be speaking about the history of the Melchizedek priesthood uh, to a great degree as contained in church history, uh, meaning the Joseph Smith uh, papers that we have online now, as well as our standard works, the scriptures, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, New Testament even. And really, you know, I've been sitting on this presentation for probably five months, and you know, just because this this uh, topic here is just uh, so critical in my mind, it's such a major piece of what we are seeing today, and and maybe what we're not seeing today, and a lot of misunderstandings going around about you know why did Joseph say this and then he changed it and he did this you know things start making a lot more sense at least they did for me you know as I study this out and you know I've these are you know these are my own conclusions um, you know I try to rely heavily on on the scriptures and what we have but when, as we start getting into church history, it becomes a little bit more vague and open to interpretation. And so, you know, my word would be that everybody should study this on their own, right? This is an important topic, and, you know, don't just rely on my words, because this changes everything. So the first scripture I want to start off with is the scripture in Doctrine and Covenants 124 verse 32 and this happened in January 1841 and the saints were in Nauvoo and the scripture starts out like this but behold at the end of this appointment and this is for building the Nauvoo temple in the Nauvoo house your baptisms for your dead shall not be acceptable unto me and if you do not these things at the end of the appointment, ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. Right. And so what is what does this mean? Right. There's not, you know, as I study this out, there are no good explanations that can be found from the church's websites or from their manuals on this verse. Right. You know, what was happening, what was going on, you know, leading up to this and what happened after. And, you know, and it's going to be, I think, a surprise to a lot of people, you know, what what this meant. It's going to break a lot of sacred cows or I think that's how you say it. Um, uh, you know, it's it's, you know, things that we have been uh, told is going to be a little bit different what you're going to see in this presentation and so you know you know don't take my word for it but like as I said you know because you know a lot of pride comes in uh, when talking about priesthood and so you know you're going to have to study this out and hopefully you know I'll, I'll provide some good resources for you to go search for but and take that you know take your conclusions to the Lord in prayer so what we can start to understand is there are different levels or degrees or orders and the language is not uh, the naming conventions you know they're not super clear they change and you know and we'll see a little bit of understanding why but there's this first degree is what I'm going to call it just you know to keep it clear about what I'm talking about of the Melchizedek priesthood and we get an understanding from this from Joseph and Oliver that they were ordained by Peter James and John to this and I'm going to call it the first degree of Melchizedek priesthood um, it's also called apostolic priesthood as well as other names and it can be really confusing and this is why people are just uh, you know are kind of a mess about this but it, it's all the same thing there and this was purported to have happened between May and June of 1829. So, you know, just less than a year before the church was formally organized. And so we don't have an actual count. 
of you know what exactly happened other than kind of this after the fact uh, verses here in Doctrine and Covenants 27 and this was these verses were added to the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants now there are some people going around you know and, and and are starting to doubt, you know, that, you know, did Peter and James and John really come because Joseph never talked about them? He didn't document any of it, and and so, you know, you know, maybe this didn't really happen. Um, what I would say is, you know, if it wasn't true, what we're about to read, you know, I would think that Joseph would have removed it from the Doctrine and Covenants. He was alive in 1835, or denounced it, you know, that it was untrue or a mistake. So here in verse 12 it says, And also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, this being Joseph, and by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles, right? this was along with Oliver Cowdery, and special witnesses of my name, and bear the keys of your ministry and of the same things which I revealed unto them, unto whom I have committed the keys of my kingdom, in a dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of times, in the which I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. And so we have this, you know, eight, you know, this is put in the 1835 edition, obviously years later, but it references an event, right, that happened or that, you know, that Joseph would have said have happened, even though he didn't document it, you know, and maybe, uh, you know, you know, Joseph wasn't a great documenter, other than, you know, he had people, that's why he had all these, you know, scribes and, you know, writing things in his journal for him, and so, you know, he was probably busy and as such, but, um, let's see here, so, you know, what is it about the Melchizedek priesthood that this first degree can do, right? And so what we'll see here is that there are, there's actually two parts to this Melchizedek priesthood, this first degree, as I'm calling it. There is an ordination. So, you know, we just saw previously that, um, right, Joseph and Oliver were ordained, right? They were ordained by Peter, James, and John. So there is an ordination. We also get some of that understanding from Alma chapter 13. And and so when you're ordained to the priesthood and, um, you know, you can baptize a person into the church of Christ. Now that may sound a little bit foreign, you know, to the typical I was, I'm going to say in the box, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it's going to start making sense. Right? That was the first name of the church, was the Church of Christ that Joseph Smith restored. And it is a terrestrial level, is, is what I'm going to uh, categorize it as. This is the church that Jesus Christ established among the Nephites as well. And... When the church was organized, April 6, 1830, it's interesting to note that they actually rebaptized people, right? And so, you know, from what I can understand and piece together, you know, if, uh, you know, we take the ordination to the Aaronic priesthood performed by John the Baptist, which was a month or so prior to the ordination given by Peter, James, and John, then he had authority to baptize people, right? That is one of, that is something that someone with an Aaronic priesthood can do. And so this is a, an important note here is why were they rebaptized when the church was organized? And so we're going to get into that understanding of that answer or that question you know why would they be rebaptized if they if Joseph had previously baptized them? Okay, and then the other part of this is the sealing, and I think this is probably a very 
new concept for uh, men in the, you know in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? Is there's an ordination and there's a sealing, but we you know we don't talk about what the sealing is in or being sealed to your priesthood, what that means, you know. And so we do find that if someone is sealed to the priesthood, that they can, by the laying on of hands, give the gift to the Holy Ghost. And that's in Moroni chapter 2. We, we get a little bit more explicit instruction in Doctrine and Covenants 76, verse 52, that says, quote, that by keeping the commandments, they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins, this is baptism by water, and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the hands of him who is ordained and sealed unto this power. So what this is saying is that in order to right, put your lay your hands on someone's head and give them the, what we would call normally the gift of the Holy Ghost, or perhaps a baptism of fire Holy Ghost, and, and same thing, first comforter, same thing, that that person has to not only be ordained to the first order or first degree or first level of Melchizedek priesthood, but they have to have been sealed unto that power to be able to do, give that, right? And so, um, you know, the first degree of Melchizedek priesthood, right, you cannot also ordain someone to that priesthood unless you've been sealed. And so we see an example of that Joseph's not authorized to confer the priesthood to others until June 9th, 1830. So this would be, you know, about a year later from when Peter, James, and John came, right? And so for that year, and typically, you know, based on what I understand is that, you know, you are ordained into a priesthood and then you receive testing from God before he will seal that priesthood upon you so that you have power to act in that priesthood to you know to do carry out the manifestations of godliness and so another man cannot seal your priesthood upon you right? only God can do that um, and we see an example of that and we'll read this later on in 3rd Nephi chapter 11 verse 36 so, you know, we say that a person can, you know, also be baptized by the Aaronic priesthood, right? And so that's true, um, you know, but just to call out, you know, that I'm going to be addressing, you know, there's a difference between a bad, being baptized with the Aaronic priesthood and being baptized with the Melchizedek priesthood. In this screenshot here, this is from the June 9th, 1830 meeting. This was a, you know, one of the first, I think it was the first conference of the church. And so here I've highlighted, says Samuel H. Smith was ordained an elder under the hand of Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith Sr. and Hiram Smith were ordained priests. And then down below we have, now it's not clear were these people also ordained or were they previously ordained um, you know the timing on this is not in here but we have the those are the elders of the church so David Whitmer John Whitmer Peter Whitmer uh, Ziva Peterson and then Samuel H Smith and then we have the priests of the church which is Martin Harris Hiram Smith Joseph Smith senior and then the teachers of the church Hiram Page and uh, I think it's Christian Whitmer Always hard to read these original documents, but they do have transcriptions if you go to the Joseph Smith papers. So there was this curious event that happened, and it's not widely understood or taught. And this is what I would suggest would be the second degree of the Melchizedek priesthood being introduced into the church. And so this happened, you know, so we just came from 1830, 
So this is now 1831, about a year later, after Joseph started ordaining men to be an elder, priest, and teacher in the office of priest in the office or offices of the priesthood. And this was held at the schoolhouse at the Isaac Morley farm. And in the notes, you know, of the, the journals, what is documented is that Joseph ordained five men to the high priesthood. So this is a higher priesthood than what he had before, right? Or, or to whom he had been ordaining, right? He ordained elders before, and now this is the high priesthood. And then following that, Lyman White ordained 16 other men to the high priesthood. Now, here's where we start to get an understanding of perhaps their lack of understanding of what was going on. And so here in, in one of the Joseph Smith papers, October 25th, 1831, right, just a few months later, says, quote, speaking about the priesthood, Levi Hancock remarked that, quote, neither of us understood what it was. I did not understand it, wrote Hancock. And he, White, being Lyman White, could give me no light. According to the minutes, Joseph Smith and Rigdon viewed those elders holding the high priesthood as having powers that other elders did not have. Okay, so that goes along with it had higher powers, right? But clearly in this journal entry, right, the we don't have a lot of documentation, you know, we don't have a lot of clear instruction, you know, on on what happened and, and the bestowal of the Smelchizik priesthood, you know, you know, two men once again upon the earth. And you can right, because it was new, right? This perhaps they didn't have the framework to understand what it meant. Right. And so we you know, and so a lot of people use that saying, Well, they never wrote things about the priesthood back then. Uh, they did, but they didn't, it seems like a lot of them didn't perhaps understand it fully. Well, but what does this do? What does this high priesthood do? Okay, or this second degree of Melchizedek priesthood do? And so let me go through some of these verses here. And Helaman chapter 10, starting verse 3 through 11, right, talks about Nephi, the son of Helaman, how he's pretty much sealed to this higher priesthood, and he's sealed by the voice of God, right? And we also get this as well in Genesis, uh, the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 14, right? Starting verse 27, and thus having been approved of God, right? So God puts his approval upon you, he, being Enoch, was ordained a high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, and it being after the order of the Son of God. Right? That's similar language to what's used in, in Alma chapter 13. Which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father or mother, it's not passed down, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. Right? This is literally God calling you right this is how I would say prophets have been throughout history right this is how they're called is they're actually called to this higher priesthood and ordained unto it by by God right or, or by, via his angels yeah. and it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed by an oath by himself, that every one that being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course. Right? We start to understand, hey, this is some things that Moses did. Right? Moses was ordained and sealed by God's own voice to this high priesthood. And continuing to put at defiance the armies of nations to divide the earth, to break every band, 
to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and by this, by the will of the Son of God, which was from the, before the foundation of the world. And so we're going to see, um, you know, this is this is kind of some uh, things that the end time servant's going to do. Right? He's going to defy the armies of nations, right? And he's going to do a lot more with the priesthood, it having been sealed, you know, this higher priesthood having been sealed upon him. Um, let's see here. Yeah, well, and I'll say, right, and so you can control the elements, right? Split in the seas, moving mountains, right? And so as we imagine an exodus in this end time that will happen, it will be led by someone or someones who have this sealing power. That's a little bit different understanding. You know, it's uh, you know we understand that as being temple marriage, right? But it's much more than that. This sealing power to control the elements, you know, to loose upon earth, and how a highway to Zion may occur. Right? They will move mountains. Right, they will form up the path, this highway, to Zion. That's how it will be done, and that is also how, you know, how things will be built. They will be built using the priesthood. We look at ancient history, and we see these huge, you know, these ancient sites. You know, I, th I think of the location, uh, the Temple of Bacchus, and I don't have a picture here, but these huge uh, stone blocks that we can't even move in our, with our technology today. And, and they are fitted with laser pre precision, right? Those were built with the priesthood. So here's a little bit of a chart and maybe help lay out how this is you know, organized. And so you'll see here some screenshots I put in here. So Joseph says there's three grand orders of priesthood. And so here, you know, this is where we start getting a little bit confusing, but he's he calls it different names in other places. And so, but right here he's saying the first is the king of Shalom or Salem, who's the king of Salem, Melchizedek, right? And then there's a second priesthood, which he calls patriarchal authority. And then we have the third uh, priesthood, which is Levitical. And so this first level here, um, they're called appendages. So you'll see here. So everything is kind of an appendage to this higher priesthood, the second degree. And so in Doctrine and Covenants 8429, and again, the offices of elder, right? So here's elder and bishop. So we have bishop over here, are necessary appendages belonging unto the high priesthood. Doctrine and Covenants 107, verse 5. All other authorities or offices in the church are appendages to this priesthood. Okay. And we learn here, Joseph Smith said, quote, Abraham's priesthood was of greater power than Levi's. So over here we got Levi's, or maybe we typically think of that as kind of like Aaronic. And Melchizedek's, the person, you know, Melchizedek, the person, was of greater power than that of Abraham's. So that would suggest that Abraham was a an elder, right? In this kind of first level of of Melchizedek priesthood, and that who he went to pay tithes to, being Melchizedek, and Melchizedek had a greater power or a higher priesthood than Abraham. And over here, Aaronic priesthood. Right is another appendage. So Doctrine Covenants 107.13, the second priesthood, right? So just naming conventions, is called the priesthood of Aaron because it was conferred upon Aaron and his seed throughout all their generations. Why is it called the lesser priesthood? Because it is an appendage to the greater, or the Melchizedek priesthood, and has the power of administering outward ordinances. Okay, and that, that being like baptism, right? 
and Doctrine Covenants 8430, the offices of teacher and deacon are necessary appendages belonging to the lesser, lesser priesthood, which priesthood was confirmed upon Aaron and his sons. So hopefully this kind of helps, you know, organize your thoughts. You know, as we're talking about, you can think back to this image. Now I have in here, I won't read, read through those um, scriptures here, but the second degree uh, Melchizedek priesthood, is also called greater priesthood, Dr. Covenant 84, the holy priesthood, you can read through all those references, the high priesthood, and the holy order, you know, of the Son of God. You know, sometimes there's other words put in there. But all these are referencing this higher priesthood. Okay. So, so this is a quote here from the Joseph Smith papers here, and someone wrote this down. I can't remember if it was um, William Clayton. I'd have to click on that link to see. I'm not remembering at the moment, but it says, quote, Joseph further said that God had often sealed up the heavens because of covetousness in the church, said that the Lord would cut his work short in righteousness and accept the church receive the fullness of the scriptures that they would yet fall. So this is given 1831. This is after the church has already been established. And you know what does this have to do with anything, right? Why you know why are we reading this right now? Well, we're going to see that this statement would end up being prophetic of what would happen in the church, right? That the Lord would actually cut His work short. And because in, essentially we would not receive the fullness of the scriptures, right? And we would subsequently fall, right? Or be demoted. And so what do we have here, right? Um, you know, after this is given, October 1831, we get the, perhaps you know this already, but in Dr. Covenant 84, we get the, uh, I would call it infamous maybe, condemnation that's given to the entire church, 1832. And so it says, right, that, in, um, you know, we as a whole church were put into condemnation, and for a long time, you know, you know, for decades after, you know, and perhaps on purpose, you know, I, would, I might uh, submit, you know, we have not understood what that condemnation meant. But we can start, as we'll look through this presentation, we're going to see the evidences of what happened in Scripture as a result from this uh, condemnation that is give, put over the entire church. So in these verses, right, that we're going to read in Dr. Covenants 84, you know, the, the saints either, one, did not know, two, they forgot, or three, they did not want to seek after the covenant that we're asked to make in the Book of Mormon. So starting with verse 54, And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief, and because you have treated lightly the things which you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion, even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. Right? Don't just say it with your lips. Right? It's a lot deeper than that. And so, right, the vast majority in our day do not understand what is this talking about. Right? And, you know, how many of the latter saints are out there, right, who... Um, who suffer this book to remain on their shelves week after week without ever reading a page of these precious things. Right? That's from Orson Pratt right? and Joseph Fielding Smith. I could make a guess, and I do not think it would be too far out if I did say that one half of the members of the church have not read the Book of Mormon. He said this in 1970. Uh, Ezra Tapp Benson, the Book of Mormon has not been, nor is it yet, the center of our personal study, 
of this we must repent. And Ezra Tap Benson again, as a church, we are under condemnation for not exerting sufficient spiritual effort to understand, teach, and live by every word in the Book of Mormon. But we are still God's people, and he loves us. In the 84th section of Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord decreed that the whole church was under condemnation, even all the children of Zion, because of the way they treated the Book of Mormon. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent, said the Lord, and remember the new covenant even the Book of Mormon, right? Zion cannot be, cannot fully arise and put on her beautiful garments if she is under this condemnation. And so we, you know, these are just some affirmations right, from leaders of the church, speaking of how important this is. And, and right from the screenshot here at the bottom, right, in the introduction of the Book of Mormon, we are told that the Book of Mormon you know, Joseph Smith tells us that it contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Well, what, what did we just read in this prophecy, right? Is that the Lord would cut work as short in righteousness and accept the church receive the fullness of the scriptures, right? That they would yet fall. And did they fall, right? Well, it, it's appearing that this is starting to happen. And we're going to see this domino effect, so when it's saying here that, you know, they shall remain under condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, that's not just about reading the book, right? It's, it's, about, it's about what's in the book, right? And what we are instructed to actually do, right? Not just learn lessons and, you know, there's, it's this, there's a covenant, right? And, um... Elder Russell M. Nelson here in October 1999 General Conference. He started off his talk by saying, Not only after my call to serve as one of the twelve apostles, I was summoned to the office of the president of the quorum, President Ezra Tapp Benson. He expressed deep concern that our members of the church did not fully appreciate the value of the Book of Mormon. With emotion in his voice, he read to me from the 84th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. And we just read that. Right. And by the, that time, President Benson had completely captured my attention. He then concluded his admonition, quote, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon. Right. And so, you know, as we think about this, you know, think about it to yourself. You know, do I know what this covenant in the Book of Mormon is? Do I know how I'm supposed to do it. And so, you know, I'll tell you that it is not plural or temple slash temple marriage. That is not the new and everlasting covenant. And because the Book of Mormon doesn't teach that plural marriage slash temple marriage is the new and everlasting covenant. And so if you have any questions about what that is, I would uh, direct you to go watch my video I did called Remember the Everlasting Covenant for uh, a deep dive that uh, fully deserves your attention. Each one of us has to understand this everlasting covenant and enter into it to make it to uh, Zion. So we get this condemnation in 1832. Well, let's start looking at the dominoes here. Two years later, in 1834, the leaders of the church, right, um, they're having a meeting and they change the name of the church, right? So in Doctrine and Covenants introduction, here's a screenshot over here, we say, it says that the Book of Commandments, which was the precursor to Doctrine and Covenants, was for the government of the Church of Christ, okay? And so based on scriptures, that is supposed to be the name of the church. It's, it's supposed to be called the Church of Christ. And so here's scriptures that you can look at, 3 Nephi 27, 4 Nephi chapter 1, and Moroni chapter 6. And what happens is that Christ has his name removed from the church. And the name of the church goes from Church of Christ to, and you can see here the screenshot of the Kirtland Temple, it goes to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. 
right? So was this a mistake? You know, did did they do this intentionally? Why would they remove the name of Christ, right? In the what Book of Mormon teaches us is if it has, you know, if it's has the name of Christ and it's built on his teachings, his doctrine, right? That it should be called after his name. But if it's not his church, that if it was the church of Moses or Enoch, right? Or perhaps the church of the Latter-day Saints or the church of man, right? That it would be called that as such. And so here's a screenshot of the minutes recorded from that meeting in May 3rd, 1834, where Joseph Smith Jr., he was chosen as the moderator, right, in this meeting. And a motion was made to, uh, you know, to change the name of the church hereafter to be known as the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And it was put up by the moderator, being Joseph Smith, and it passed. Now, the church today tries to explain that, saying, well, there were a lot of Church of Christ, and so, you know, we think maybe they changed it to the Church of Latter-day Saints to distinguish themselves. And that might, you know, pass, but as you start looking at the pieces and seeing the bigger picture of what is going on, why things are happening within the context, right, we can start to understand that, well, the church came under condemnation, and so one of those consequences was that Christ withdrew his name, right? It was demoted from the Church of Christ to the Church of Man, or Latter-day Saints. In 1836, this is the, at Dr. Cohen's 109, we, at the Kirtland Temple dedication, right? We get an indicator here. Now this is, right, you have to be a detective, you know, you know, investigating all these details and putting them together, right, to see the bigger picture. And we see that that wasn't a mistake. They were consciously aware of that changing the name of church and what that meant. And it says this, quote, And be restored to the blessings which thou hast ordained to be poured out upon those who shall reverence thee in thy house, that thy church may come forth out of the wilderness of darkness, and also this church to put upon it thy name. Right. Joseph Smith is pleading in the temple dedication, 1836, two years later after the, the Lord right, had the name of the church removed. He's pleading with the Lord, put your name back upon it, this church. Right? We are in the darkness. Right? We have been demoted. So there are some exceptions that gradually happen, I think. I don't think it's right away, but we do understand in Dr. Cummins 105, this is in 1834, so two years after the condemnation is given, you know, we learn that there's at least two people, you know, who is priesthood doesn't get removed. And so here in DNC 105, starting verse 2, Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have redeemed even now. Right? So that's kind of interesting. It's saying, you know, if it wasn't for the transgressions, that they would have been redeemed, you know, even now, two years later. But they're still not doing what they need to do to remove that condemnation, which is remembering that covenant that's in the Book of Mormon and doing it. Right? And, you you know, you can't redeem something if it hadn't fallen. Right? Continuing verse 7, I speak not concerning those who are appointed to lead my people, who are the first elders of my church, for they are not all under this condemnation. And so who are the first elders of the church who are not under the condemnation? Well, using word links, we see in D&C 20, right, given in 1829, 
uh, which says, which commandments were given to Joseph Smith Jr., who, were, who was called of God and ordained an apostle of Jesus Christ to be the first elder of this church, and to Oliver Cowdery, who was ca also called of God and apostle of Jesus Christ to be the second elder of this church and ordained under his hand. So these are the first elders or first and second elders of the church, which would be Joseph Smith Jr. and Oliver Cowdery. And so, you know, whether they, you know, fell and came back up or they never fell, you know, it's not clear. It's not explicit, right? But we do find that by 1834, so this is a month after the name of the church was removed, that, you know, that the first elders here were not under this same condemnation. Now let's look at the temple, Kirtland Temple dedication, right? So if Joseph Smith, right, he, you know, he hasn't been, he's not under this condemnation at this point. This is 1836, two years later, after the church's, Christ's name was removed from the church. And so he still has his priesthood, his Melchizedek priesthood. And so here in Joseph Smith's journal, uh, what we'll see here is, it starts to be interesting and will lead us f further into understanding what happens or doesn't happen later on. It says, quote, I gave them instruction in relation to the spirit of prophecy and called upon the congregation to speak and not fear to prophesy good concerning the saints. For if you prophesy the falling of these hills and the rising of these valleys, the downfall of the enemies of Zion and the rising of the kingdom of God, it shall come to pass. Do not quench the spirit. Right? Don't put it out. Don't, right? For the first one that opens his mouth shall receive the spirit of prophecy. That's recorded by George A. Smith. And he arose and he began to prophesy when a voice was heard like the sound of a rushing mighty wind which filled the temple. And all the congregation simultaneously arose, being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Other, others saw glorious visions, and I beheld the temple was filled with angels, which fact I declared to the congregation. The people in the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was transpiring. The number present on this occasion was 416. Right? So this is being a greater number of official members than ever assembled on any formal occasion, and this continued until the meeting closed at 11 p.m. Right? We see this uh, what happens when, right, somebody who holds high priesthood, right, and what power, right, he is able to bring, right, at this temple dedication, right? Can we say that we have ever seen this happen in our day? Dr. Covenants 84, and this greater priesthood administereth and holdeth the keys the key of the mystery of the kingdoms and even the key of knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, so what ordinances? Well, like the, uh, perhaps the uh, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Or, you know, in, in other uh, ordinances, right? Right, the baptism, uh, fire and Holy Ghost, right? Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. It, it, it is shown, right? Just like we read here about the Kirtland De Temple dedication, right? The power of godliness is shown when someone who has the greater priesthood and without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood. So if you don't have this higher priesthood, this greater priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. So if we're not seeing the power of godliness being manifested, right, in our temples, for example, right, 
either the ordinances aren't there or correct, you might say, and or the authority of the priesthood is not there to do that. So we get some some insight into the men who are going to lead the church after Joseph Smith's death. And so we have the apostles. They are called in November 3rd of 1835 here. And this is what Oliver Cowdery tells them. He says, You have been indebted to other men in the first instance for evidence on that you have acted. But it is necessary that you receive a testimony from heaven for yourselves so that you can bear testimony to the truth of the Book of Mormon and that you have seen the face of God. That is more than the testimony of an angel. When the proper time arrives, you shall bear testimony that you have seen God. Never cease striving until you have seen God face to face. Your ordination is not full and complete till God has laid his hand upon you. Right, This is that part of you've been ordained an apostle, but God hasn't laid his hand upon you to seal it. It's not full. It's not complete. Right, We require as much to qualify us as did those who had gone before us. God is the same. If the Savior in former days laid his hands on his disciples, why not in the latter days? Um, right, so, so that's February 1835. Right, and so you start to understand that the apostles, you know, they have some work to do. Right, they're, they're relying on the testimony, it says, from others. Right? They haven't quite received a testimony from heaven for themselves. Right? They haven't seen God face to face. Right? And how does, you know, do do our leaders today, right? Do they testify that they have seen God face to face? Right? If you have, you would you would bear that testimony. Well, what happens here, so February 1835, so towards the end of the year, in November 1835, we then get another revelation here from Joseph Smith. It says, Thus came the word of the Lord unto me concerning the twelve, saying, Behold, they are under condemnation, because they have not been sufficiently humble in my sight, and in consequence of their covetous desires, in that they have not dealt equally with each other in the division of the monies which came into their hands. Verily thus saith the Lord your God, I appointed these twelve, that they should be equal in their ministry, in their portion, in their evangelical rites. Wherefore they have sinned, a very grievous sin, inasmuch as they have made themselves unequal, and have not hearkened unto my voice. Therefore let them repent speedily, and prepare the hearts for the solemn assembly, for the great day which is to come. Verily thus saith the Lord, Amen. So it wasn't too long that, you know, not even a year later that the apostles came under condemnation for not doing what they were supposed to do. Um, so this is the state, and it, and it doesn't get better for them, right? They seek to rebel and exalt themselves over Joseph Smith. Um, and, we, and we can read about that in Doctrine and Covenants. So here are some prophecies about the priesthood returning. Right? And so, you know, these these apostles, you know, it seems like, you know, they were ordained under the hand of Oliver Cowdery and given, you know, that if we remember the, you know, the an apostle is an elder, right? It's in that first level of Melchizedek or first degree of Melchizedek priesthood, right? And they have received the ordination, right? And so, but they have not received that sealing. And so you cannot, they cannot uh, ordain other men to the Melchizedek priesthood. You can only do that once you have been sealed, right? And so 
we get this prophecy here in Doctrine and Covenants 113, and it tells us when Zion is going to be redeemed, which hasn't happened yet, that the power of the priesthood would return, which had been lost. So starting verse, um, we'll, we'll just say, start verse 8 here. He had reference, being Isaiah, to those whom God should call in the last days, right? Who should hold the power of the priesthood to bring again Zion, right? right? We tried to establish Zion in the 1830s. Didn't work out, right? But this is going to be in the last days, or, or as I like to call it, the end times, right? That there are going to be those who will hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion, the redemption of Israel, and to put on her strength is to put on the authority of the priesthood which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage, right? also to return to that power which she had lost. Well, what power? Well, that power of the priesthood just mentioned a few lines above, right? That power that comes when someone is ordained to that second, that high priesthood, and is sealed by the voice of God to be able to control the elements, because that is imperative to have to redeem Zion. We're going to need that power of the priesthood, and it was lost, right? It says the power which she had lost. And then in Doctrine and Covenants 121 here, right, we read this, and I think in and of itself, if you just keep it, you know, just read it by itself, you know, you might just skip past it. You might, it may not trigger any thoughts. But as we start understanding the bigger picture here, and we see all, you know, these these little pieces that we need to put together, right, we get a better understanding, right? It fills out the picture. And so verse 16, it talks about those who are lifting their heel against mine anointed, right? These are, you know, they're, they're rebelling and exalting themselves over Joseph. This is talking about the 12 apostles, which we just read his reprimand of them, right? And they swear falsely against my servants that they might bring them into bondage and death. And this is what happened. Joseph was being undermined by, you know, by those who, who would call him his friend. And they were not his friends, right? And they were working with the enemy. Right? They, and they shall be severed from the ordinances of mine house. So as we think back about to Doctrine and Covenants 84, right, where it requires the ordinances and the authority, right, the correct ordinances, in order for the power, right, of godliness to be manifest, well, it's saying that they're going to be severed from those ordinances, the true ordinances, and in verse 20, covenant curses are going to come upon them. And then verse 21, they shall not have right to the priesthood nor their posterity after them from generation to generation. Right? Now we can start to understand this a little bit clearer now, um, understanding the context of what has been happening. Now, this is brings us back to the beginning of where I started out, right? That scripture in Doctrine and Covenants 124, right? And, where, and the church is given an ultimatum, right? You got to complete the temple right? and the Nauvoo house. I'll throw in that. You got to complete those buildings, right? Or not. And, and you're going to get the consequences even further. So here, this is given in January 1841. Once again, Doctrine and Covenants 124. And we get more understanding about what has happened, right? It may not have been super clear, right? And, and I've been speaking to it, right? But that the Melchizedek priesthood, the higher priesthood, was lost, you know, to the body of the church, you know, to Joseph and Oliver. It wasn't at the time, right? But it was men were not uh, doing what they needed to do. They were coming under condemnation. And so the Lord had taken away the fullness or the completeness of the priesthood, right? And so 
And he says, which we'll read, that he's, he'll restore it back if they build the Nauvoo Temple within the appointed time. Right? And so the appointed time is not specified in the scriptures. Right? There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. There's no appointed time specified given in the scriptures. And so all we can do here is look at the fruits of what happened. Right? And so we know, one thing we do know is that by the time Joseph Smith Jr. was killed, the temple was not complete. Right? They had a few outer walls done, and the basement had been dedicated. So let's read this, verse 28. For there is not a place found on earth that he may come to and restore again that which was lost unto you, or which he hath taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. So here it starts now, should be light bulbs going off, right? Part of this condemnation was taking away the fullness of the priesthood. For a baptismal font there is not upon the earth that they, my saints, may be baptized for those who are dead. For this ordinance belongeth to my house and cannot be acceptable to me only in the days of your poverty, wherein ye are not able to build a house unto me. So at this time, they are doing baptisms in the Mississippi River in Nauvoo. They were permitted to do that because they did not have a house of the Lord, you know, uh, the Nauvoo Temple at that time. And so he permitted that uh, for, for a time. But I command you, all of you, my saints, to build a house unto me. And I grant unto you a sufficient time to build a house unto me. And during this time, your baptism shall be acceptable to me. Right, the ones being done in the Mississippi River. But behold, at the end of this appointment, right, which we don't have explicit instruction about what that was, your baptisms for your dead shall not be acceptable unto me. And if you do not these things at the... What, well, which things? Well, building the temple. If you do not do these things or the Nauvoo house, which never got built, at the end of the appointment ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. For verily I say unto you that after you had the sufficient time to build a house to me, wherein the ordinance of baptizing for the dead belongeth, for which the same was instituted from before the foundation of the world, your baptisms for your dead cannot be acceptable unto me. Okay, so let's read a little bit more in this section. Because we get some ifs, I'll call them if statements. And if we do this, we'll, this will happen. If we do that, then this will happen. And this is what I mean by let's look at, let's start looking at the fruits. So, so the Lord's saying here, so if the Lord had accepted the building of the Nauvoo Temple within the appointed time, whatever that was, the Lord promised the saints that they would be able to stay there in Nauvoo and not be moved out, right? Like they had been driven out of New York, Kirtland, Missouri, right? They would get to stay. So that's the first one. For if my people will hearken unto my voice, right, this is verse 45, and unto the voice of my servants whom I have appointed to lead my people, behold, Verily I say unto you, they shall not be moved out of their place. Okay, so that's that's the condition, right? That that is that is how we can know to start. There's a lot more, right? If they did this within the appointed time, is that they would get to stay in Avu. Verse 46. But if they will not hearken unto my voice nor unto the voice of these men whom I have appointed. They shall not be blessed, because they pollute my holy grounds and my holy ordinances and charters and my holy words which I give unto them. So we're, we're going to start getting all, you know, what I have here in yellow. There's a lot more yellow, because I think the Lord knew that was the direction we were going. And so we're going to get some interesting insight into what the Lord Right? He's saying they don't have a temple yet, right? So how are they polluting the holy, you know, polluting the holy ordinances? 
already, right? They're not doing, you know, they haven't. This is in the future, right? This is this is prophecy of what is going to happen and what did happen, right? Continuing verse 47, and it shall come to pass that if you build, so he's saying if you don't build it, right? Or if you do build my house, right, in the end, and you do not do the things that I say, I will not perform the oath which I make unto you, neither fulfill the promises which ye expect at my hands, saith the Lord. Right? right. That power of godliness is not going to be manifest. I'm not going to uh, give you my oath, right, that oath and covenant of the priesthood. Right? I'm not going to seal your priesthood. You're not going to be able to do these things. Right? Even if you build the house. For instead of blessings, yea, ye by your own works bring cursings, wraths, indignation, and judgments upon your own heads by your follies and by all your abominations which you practice before me, saith the Lord. Well, what abominations were started, you know, what did, what did they implement in the Nauvoo Temple after Joseph died? Right? Well, we get that tie with Jacob 2.23, right? For this people began to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon and his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord, right? How how did they, um, let's see here, the, doo -doo -doo, right? down here, right, they they pollute the holy words which God's given them, and they've you know, Moroni tells us in Mormon chapter 8 that we have transfigured the holy word of God right, and that's what happened in D&C 132 right, this was uh, changed, a revelation given by Joseph, but changed by Brigham Young years later to what? Well, to bring abominations which we would practice into the the house of God, right, to the temple, and, and that says, right, as touching the principles and doctrine of having many wives and concubines. For behold, I reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant, and if ye abide not that covenant, then ye are damned. Right. So Brigham Young changed the new and everlasting covenant, and that was prophesied. Right. That was prophesied in. You know, Isaiah 24, verse 5, and in Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 15, that we would change the ordinances and break the everlasting covenant. And God knew we would do it. He knew for thousands of years that we would do it. And so instead of blessings, we would inherit curses. Now, it's interesting here, uh, Joseph Smith papers, Joseph Smith he wrote, this was originally, I think, in the Book of Commandments. It said, Verily, condemnation resteth upon you. And this was published in 1833. Who are appointed to lead my church and to be my saviors of men. Right? And so this might give us the understanding that, you know, was Joseph, did he come under condemnation as well? And, but then he got restored, you know? Or was he just never, right? Because it said, you know, or is this referring to the others who are appointed to lead the church, right? Um, where the condemnation is upon them. There must needs be a repentance and a reformation among you in all things, in your examples before the church, before the world, and all. So he's, so we get this this other piece here, where Joseph Smith says that there needs to be a reformation among you in all things, okay? And he says here, right, um, eight, this is April 1842, so just over a year after the, you know, that ultimatum was given in January 1841, that if you don't build it, you're going to be rejected as church and you're dead, with your dead. Right, and he says here that the church in the screenshot is not now organized in its proper order and cannot be until the temple is completed. Right, 
and, and because it doesn't have you know because it doesn't have the complete organization and the power of the Melchizedek priesthood right and, and then here in report by William Clayton 1843 this is again towards you know the last year of Joseph's life he says quote he Joseph Smith jr. stated that Hiram held the office of prophet to the church by birthright and he was going to have a reformation, maybe we say reformation, and the saints must regard Hiram, for he has authority. So we have Joseph and Hiram. They are, you know, set to lead the church, and they both get taken out, you know, a year less than a year later. So why is Joseph doing this? You know, why is he putting Hiram in charge of the church? Right? And that Joseph was going to do a reformation, right? A reformation of what? What what is he going to reform? He is going to reform that church of Christ that was in the beginning, right? Because the church had fallen, right? It was the church of the Latter-day Saints. And, you know, he was going to form this new church. And Hiram was going to lead the, uh, you know, the current church. So we start to look here. This is looking at the fruits still, right? Because I know there's a lot of confusion on, you know, we, we made that a point of time, right? But let's continue to look at it. So... The Revel ultimatum was given in January 1841. The basement of the Nauvoo Temple was dedicated in 1841 for the baptisms for the dead. Right? So was did that, you know, absolve us, right, from the cursings that were going to happen? Well, a year later, 1842, in Doctrine Covenants 127, the Lord still had not restored what he had promised to do regarding the priesthood if the saints had met that criteria. It says in verse 8, For I am about to restore many things to the earth pertaining to the priesthood, saith the Lord of hosts. So that, so the dedication of the Nauvoo basement temple did not redeem the saints from that ultimatum yet. right? So merely dedicating right, doesn't do it. And we see here that the Nauvoo Temple, this is from the BYU library, uh, was never, you see there at the bottom, never fully finished. Right? Now there were six Nauvoo Temple dedications that I'll show you here. But what happened at that dedication? Well, one of them, it was a private dedication with selected leaders, April 30th, 1846. And it said, quote, Following the dedicatory prayers, Elder Hyde made some remarks. After the services were concluded, the entire party assembled in the attic story at the invitation of Elder Hyde and partook of some refreshments. That seems kind of like our uh, dedications today. Public dedication that was given May 1st, so it would be the next day, 1846. Quote, the public dedication began in the morning on the following day, and Samuel W. Richards recorded an interesting account of this event. He said the temple was dedicated in the presence of strangers and all who would pay $1, which equates to $38 in $2022, for admittance and attended with my wife. I was one of three who was appointed to seat the congregation in the house and stood part of the time at the door to receive tickets. The services closed between one and two. During the services, a resolution was passed that called for the sale of the temple. So, so this is at the dedication, right? Now they're proposing to sell the temple, right? With the funds to be used for the removing, for removing the poor to the uh, to the main body of the saints in the West. 1846. Joseph's been dead about two years. And they're finally dedicating it. And we see here that they dedicated the baptismal font, 
the enclosed building, the attic, the ceiling altar. Um, they did a dedication prior to their exodus to Utah, and then there was a formal dedication of the entire building. So they did six dedications, and you know, as we read about, you know, the dedication that happened in private, and even in the public that they were charging money for, right? You know, is this following? I guess, you know, the order of God in this, did this, does this resemble what happened in Kirtland when Joseph dedicated the Kirtland temple with the proper authority, right? This is how our dedication of our temples happen today, right? There's no power of godliness manifested in the way that it did with the Kirtland temple. And why is that, right? So, you know, these are questions we st need to start asking ourselves, right? So what was that appointed time, right? Was it when Joseph died? Was it when the saints left Nauvoo on the Exodus, right? Um, well, they left, right? You know, when it, when was that, right? Did God restore, did he end up restoring the fullness of the priesthood that he said he had taken away? Did God actually end up rejecting the LDS church along with our temple work? Right? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves at this point. And so let's look at the fruits even more. At the, what were the consequences? Well, they were exiled out of the promised land leading up to winter. Worst time to leave. Left, I think it was in November, right? They were they were cast out into the deserts of Utah, right? Just like the children of Israel were anciently, and were not allowed back into the Promised Land, right? We need to go redeem Zion still. Um, you know, we're just, and that's you know that's what's happening, right? There was no spiritual manifestation like Kirtland, as they dedicated the Nauvoo Temple several times, like the children of Israel, right, driven into the wilderness. There was a tornado, which was an act of God that destroys the Nauvoo temple, right? Quote DNC 93, whatever temple is defiled, God shall destroy that temple. We were given a veiled prophecy using history of what would happen if we did not remove the condemnation found in the same section that the condemnation is given in Dr. Covenant 84, verse 25. Therefore he took Moses, the Lord's not talking about Moses, he's using him as a metaphor for Joseph Smith, the prophet of the people. Therefore he took Joseph Smith Jr. out of their midst and the holy priesthood also, and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood, holdeth the key of the ministering of angels in the preparatory gospel, which that's the Melchizedek, or the Aaronic priesthood, right? In JST, Exodus 34, For I will take away the priesthood out of their midst, therefore my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them, for my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. But I will give unto them the law as at first, but it shall be after the law of carnal commandments, for I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my presence, into my rest in the days of their pilgrimage. And just as another parallel there. So some clarifying points here. The scriptures never say that the Melchizedek priesthood would be taken away. In Doctrine and Covenants section 13, verse 1, it tells us that it is only the Aaronic priesthood that will never be taken away from the earth. Joseph Smith said, quote, Was the priesthood of Melchizedek taken away when Moses died? All priesthood is Melchizedek, but there are different portions or degrees of it. That portion which was, which was brought to Moses to speak with God face to face was taken away. Right? And that's what, if you remember, in the ordination that was given to the Apostles of our day of Joseph Smith's day, right, the twelve apostles, they were set told to go seek the face of God, right? But they didn't, and they didn't claim to, and they, right? 
but that portion which Moses to speak with God face to face was taken away. But that which was brought, the ministry of angels, remained. That's the Aaronic priesthood, the ministry of angels. All the prophets had the Melchizedek priesthood and were ordained by God himself. Isn't that interesting? Not through a seniority line of succession of men ordaining each other. It was they were ordained by God himself. And so that's, right, is President Nelson, our current prophet, president of the church, is he a prophet like Joseph Smith? Easy answer. No, he's not. He doesn't do what Joseph Smith did. He can't do it. So some other clarifying points. The Aaronic priesthood is not lost by unworthiness. Otherwise, the children of Israel, anciently, would have lost it. Right? They wouldn't have had it. But God can remove the Melchizedek priesthood from such a man in in you know through unrighteousness and so dr Cohen's 121 the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness right that they may be conferred upon us is true it was the priesthood okay the priesthood was was conferred upon the apostles right that's true but when we undertake to cover our sins to gratify our pride, our vain ambition to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the men of children of men in any degree of unrighteousness. Behold, the heavens withdraw themselves. The spirit of the Lord is grieved. And when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man. Behold, ere he is aware, he is left unto himself to kick against the pricks. So, you know, are people aware? Were they aware that the priesthood was removed from them as they came under these the condemnation and under the cursings of not having built the Nauvoo Temple? Perhaps, perhaps not. But regardless, right, it was taken from them. Now, looking at our other scriptures we get a lot of other parallels and perhaps prophetic parallels that tell us for our day especially here in the book of mormon that this was going to happen right so nephi was preaching repentance and and baptism by water for at least 32 years leading up to the coming of christ to america Third Nephi chapter 7, verse 23, And it came to pass that Nephi went forth among the people and also many others, baptizing unto repentance. Right? He was not baptizing to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right? He was baptizing unto repentance, in which there was a great remission of sins. Now it's interesting, right? We find that the time leading up to Christ, the Melchizedek priesthood was not there among the people. Nephi, you know, he, he's a prophet, right? He is baptizing with the Aaronic priesthood, we're going to see. And thus passed away the 32nd year also. And Nephi did cry unto the people in the commencement of the 33rd year, and he did preach unto them repentance and remission of sins. Now I would have you to remember also that there were none who were brought into repentance who were not baptized with water. Therefore they were ordained of Nephi, men unto this ministry, that all such should come unto them, should be baptized with water. And this as a witness and a testimony before God and unto the people that they had repented and received a remission of their sins. So we find out the Melchizedek priesthood right, was not around because Nephi could not give the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All right, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands until Christ ordains him to the Melchizedek priesthood in 3 Nephi chapter 11, verse 19 through 22, and seals, right, going back to the beginning of our presentation here, seals that power in 3 Nephi chapter 18, right, that until he seals the Melchizedek priesthood upon him right, when Jesus established the church of Christ among the Nephites. So we get here, and Nephi arose and went forth and bowed himself before the Lord and kissed his feet. And the Lord commanded him that he should rise, and he rose and stood before him. 
And the Lord said unto him, I give unto you the power that ye shall baptize this people when I am again ascended into heaven. So let's take a pause. Wait a minute. Why is Christ giving him the power to baptize? He was just doing that for 32 years. right? So we start to understand here there is a difference between being baptized with the Aaronic priesthood and being baptized with the Melchizedek priesthood into the higher order. And again, the Lord called others and said unto them likewise. And he gave unto them power to baptize. Well, Nephi, right, we just read that. Nephi uh, ordained other men unto the ministry that they should go forth and baptizing people as well. right? And he said unto them, On this wise shall you baptize, that there should be no disputations among you. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of these sayings, he touched his hand, the disciples whom he had chosen one by one, even until he had touched them all and spake unto them as he touched. And the multitude heard not the words which he spake. Therefore they did not bear record, but the disciples bear record that he gave them the power to give the Holy Ghost. And I will show you unto you hereafter that this record is true. Right, That by keeping the commandments they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of them who is ordained and sealed unto this power. Right? That's from the Doctrine of Covenant 76. Right? When Christ touched him, right, or laid his hands upon them, he gave them that seal. He sealed their priesthood. Right? He gave them the, the Melchizedek priesthood that they should do Melchizedek priesthood baptisms into the Church of Christ, which is a higher level than the Church of Man or Church of Latter-day Saints. And, and then he sealed their power later on so that they could give the gift of the Holy Ghost to others. Well, what else? Well, let's look at the New Testament here. The Pharisees were baptized. Well, let me back up real quick and just say, right, this story here is what Mormon, the prophet Mormon was trying to tell us. Right? He's trying to tell, give us these stories to tell us if we have eyes to see, if we study the words of God, to see that this would be happening to us, to the Latter-day Saints, right? that we would not have the Melchizedek priesthood. Right? We, we fell. We were condemned. We were rejected as a church, you know, as Christ's church. Go into to New Testament. The Pharisees were baptizing, right? They were baptized only with the Aaronic priesthood, and that was passed down the line of succession, right? And they, um, you know, the Aaronic priesthood cannot be lost through unworthiness, and it is passed down, right? Father, son, etc. That's how they did it back then. And John the Baptized, right? He was ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood when he was eight days old. You read that in Doctor Covenants 84. And so John the Baptist was baptizing into the terrestrial order or the Church of Christ of the gospel, right? Which requires a Melchizedek priesthood baptism. JST, Matthew chapter 9, starting verse 18. Then said the Pharisees unto him, unto Christ, Why will you not receive us, the Pharisees, right, with our baptism? That's done with the Aaronic priesthood. Seeing we keep the whole law, but Jesus said unto him, un, unto them, ye keep not the law. If ye had kept the law, ye would have received me. For I am he who gave the law. I receive you not with your baptism, because it profiteth you nothing. For when you, for when that which is new is come, the old is ready to be put away. In Luke chapter 7, verse 29, And all the people that heard him, and the publicans, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Right, and so the right Christ is telling them that your ironic priesthood baptism, right, it's right, essentially it you know, it's preparatory, it doesn't save. Right? Preparatory is better than nothing, but it doesn't save. Right, you have to receive the baptism by the Melchizedek priesthood, which we do not do 
in the church. And so you'll note that the baptism prayer that is given in Doctrine and Covenants was changed to say, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you, right? right? That was the Aaronic priesthood one. The baptism by someone who holds the true Melchizedek priesthood is given in the Book of Mormon, right? Where Christ says, this is what you say, right? Having authority given me by Jesus Christ, I baptize you. There's a difference there in those baptism prayers. So, you know, I've kind of called this out already. I'll just cover this quickly, right? Isaiah 24, right? It's talking about the earth is going to be made empty, right? The earth is defiled, right? And it says, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant, right? This is not the great apostasy before Joseph Smith. This is the end times, right? The last days when this happens, right? They break the everlasting covenant. We have broken the everlasting covenant. And judgments are coming upon us because of that. And then, right, Mormon, why have you transfigured the holy word of God? Why have you polluted the holy church of God? Only we, LDS, can do that. We have transfigured the word of God because we say, new and everlasting covenant is, is temple marriage now, when it's not. That's not what the Book of Mormon taught, and that was the reason, right? We don't understand, we haven't made, we don't teach it in our church today what the everlasting covenant is, the true everlasting covenant. We have changed the word of God, right? Dr. Cohen's 1, verse 15, echoes Isaiah 24, where they strayed might from my ordinances and broke my everlasting covenant, right? Look at the uh, verses leading up to it. Right, their iniquity shall be spoken upon the housetops, their secret acts be revealed. Right, this stuff was hidden from the history of the church, from yeah. right, so that such that we don't, we didn't, we didn't, we haven't known this for decades and decades, right? That this is what happened, and now they are being revealed on the housetops through the internet. And Doctrine and Covenants 112, right? Upon my house it shall begin, for my house it shall go forth first among those among you. Who are the first among us? If you look at verses 20 and verses 30 that surround verses 25 and 26, you'll see that those who are first among us are the first presidency in the apostles. This is a prophecy about our day. And it says, those who have professed to know my name and, and have not known me, why don't they know him? Because they haven't, right? They haven't seen God face to face. They have not come into his presence. Just as the first apostles, right, in our dispensation, right, with Joseph Smith, right, they did not seek the face of God. They got condemned, and they have blasphemed me against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. How how are the apostles blaspheming? They're saying they have authority when they don't. And then DNC 64, for it shall come to pass that the inhabitants of Zion shall judge all things pertaining to Zion. Right When Zion is redeemed, this hasn't happened yet. This is in the future. And liars and hypocrites shall be proved by them, Right, the inhabitants, the people who are living in Zion, and they who are not apostles and prophets shall be known. Well, which apostles and prophets? The ones who say they are prophets and apostles. And so what are we, you know, what do we do now? Right? We have these men. You know, do they hold authority and keys that they say they do? Do any of us hold the Melchizedek priesthood today? What spiritual fruits are we seeing that is testifying that we do? And so sometimes, you know, we need to start asking questions, studying them out, right? So I want to give you some questions to consider to end this presentation that you can take to the Lord. I would recommend you come to your own conclusion to take to the Lord. And you have to have real intent, right? That is a critical component of this, right? What's real intent means... Um, no matter what the truth is, 
you know, no matter what it is, the answer is, you know, whether it's yes or no or whatever, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do something about it. That's real intent, right? Right. Jesus Christ gave an example, right? Of, you know, someone who says they're going to do something and then they don't do it, right? They're a hypocrite. That's not exercising real intent, right? You have to go to God with real intent to get real answers from him. Otherwise he, you know, he's not going to, he's going to let you continue to be deceived, be in a delusion. Second, th in, as he says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, right? You will receive the delusion that you want. And so seeking with real intent is critical. So does President Nelson have the Melchizedek priesthood? Does he have the priesthood keys by line of succession from Joseph? You know, do I, if I'm a male, have the Melchizedek priesthood? Have I been sealed to the Melchizedek priesthood? Does the LDS Church have the Aaronic priesthood? Is LDS temple work today valid? Have any of the apostles today seen God face to face? Was Joseph Smith ordained and sealed to the Melchizedek priesthood? Does the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints certainly, um, does it currently contain or teach the fullness of the gospel? Right? Are there things you are doing because God personally revealed them to you? or because leaders asked you to do them. For example, endless genealogies in 1 Timothy 1.4 and, and other dead works that do not save. So I hope this presentation, right, it, it would probably, if you made it to this far, you know, if you weren't already aware of these things, I imagine that you would probably be in shock, uh, disbelief, um, but I would say, you know, not all is lost, right? The power of this priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood, is prophesied to return. There's a reason there will be a prophesied end time servant who is coming, and we need to to treasure up the Word of God in the Scriptures and and wait and keep looking and seeking and pay attention when this end time servant does come on uh you know come around you know to uh to the public and i'll leave this message in the name of jesus christ amen